Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to celebrate Stephen Sachs's appointment as the Antonin Scalia Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Now, before, before I introduce Steve, um, I want to give special thanks to Terry Considine, whose family foundation established the Antonin Scalia Professorship of Law. Terry couldn't be here today, uh, but we hope uh, that he will get to see this. And uh, we want to give him a, a, a very uh, a big thank you for uh, this, this chair. Terry's a 1969 graduate of Harvard College and a member of the Harvard Law School class of 1971. He was originally from San Diego, California, where he grew up on a cattle ranch as one of 11 children. And he later settled in Colorado, where he had, where he had a magnificent career as a real estate investor and as the CEO of a number of important and very impactful investment trusts. Terry is also a public servant. He was elected twice to the Colorado State Senate and he's had leadership roles in many political campaigns and organizations. And in, 19, in 2017, he was inducted into the Colorado Business Hall of Fame. He has championed educational reform and other causes through the Considine Family Trust, and the Considine Scholars Foundation, and a variety of philanthropic efforts. When he endowed the chair in 2017, Terry sought to ensure that, the, that Justice Scalia's, quote, dedication to the founding principles of the United States Constitution be recognized at Harvard Law School, his beloved alma mater. And we're very grateful to Terry Constein and the Constein Family Foundation for the chair. So let's <laughs> Now I want to add a few words about, before I, before I get to Professor Sachs, I want to add a few words about the Supreme Court Justice for whom this chair is named. Um, it's, it's personally very meaningful, me, meaningful for me to be able to celebrate Harvard Law School's first Antonin Scalia Professor of Law. Justice Scalia was, of course, a deeply influential justice who changed the way that lawyers and judges think about statutes and the Constitution. He was also a dear friend of Harvard Law School. When he passed away in, 19, in, in 2016, my predecessor, Martha Minow, recalled Justice Scalia's terrific sense of humor and his great personal warmth. She recalled that he returned here to, the, to his alma mater often, quote, to meet with our students, to judge our moot court competitions, and as he loved to do, joust with law professors and students alike. That is very true. I know that he loved all of those visits, and his time here always provoked lively discussions, both while he was here and after he left. Um, let me add that as Justice Scalia's law clerk during October term 1988, uh, I got to know him very well. He loved the law. He loved ideas. And perhaps most of all, he, he loved to mix it up. Uh, and that's, that's how we learned. And there is no better person than Stephen Sachs to be the inaugural holder of the Antonin Scalia chair. Professor Sachs teaches civil procedure, conflict of laws, and seminars on constitutional law. His research focuses on the law and theory of constitutional interpretation, the jurisdiction of state and federal courts, the history of procedure and private law, and the role of general common law and the US legal system. He's authored numerous articles, essays, and book chapters. He's an elected member of the American Law Institute, an advisor to the ALI's project on the restatement of law third, conflict of laws, a former member of the Judicial Conference's Advisory Committee on Appellate Rules, and a founding member of the Academic Freedom Alliance. Professor Sachs previously taught at Duke University School of Law and is a visiting professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Before becoming a law professor, he practiced in the Washington, D.C. litigation group of Mayor Brown, and he clerked for Just Judge Stephen Williams on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and for Chief Justice John G. Roberts, Jr. 
Professor Sachs received his JD from Yale Law School, where he was an executive editor of the Yale Law Journal. A Rhodes Scholar, he graduated from Oxford University with a first class BA honors degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. He received his AB degree, summa cum laude, in history from Harvard University, earning the Sophia Freund Prize. Professor Sachs is thoughtful, creative, and impactful. He has offered fresh and bold and brave ways of thinking about law and interpretation and about the structure and content of the US Constitution and of US law. He is a phenomenal teacher and colleague. And I am delighted to introduce my friend, Stephen Sachs, the very first Antonin Scalia Professor of Law. Thank you, Dean Manning, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm honored by the presence here of so many colleagues, teachers, students, family, and friends. Uh, I'd like to express my appreciation both to Dean Manning and to Terry Constein, who made this chair possible. I am deeply grateful for this generosity to Harvard and Harvard's to me. And I am particularly grateful and honored to hold a chair bearing the name of Justice Scalia, which carries forward his extraordinary legacy in the law. Justice Scalia was the rare judge in justice whose opinions not only filled the case books, but who did not cease to be a scholar on the bench, who took real part in the intellectual development of the law in addition to the development of doctrine. Justice Scalia stands for a model of judging that I think any academic, whatever their views, ought to admire, one in which judges have to be responsible in their day-to-day -day work to some broader theory of the law and in which they ought regularly to engage at the highest level in critiquing and defending such theories on their own terms, even as they employ them to resolve individual cases. Maybe not every judge ought to be so employed. There's room in the world for short order cooks as well as for theorists of organic chemistry. But those of us who teach organic chemistry might still be lousy at making breakfast. <laughs> but at least some judges ought to have one foot in the world of theory, because engaging in that world helps keep one honest when the pressure of deciding individual cases has so many inducements the other way. And as Justice Scalia was never one to shy away from controversy over deep and abstract principles, I think he would have appreciated my topic today, which is life after Erie. <laughs> For those who might be mystified by this title, Erie Railroad Company versus Tompkins was the most important case that no one who isn't a lawyer has ever heard of. <laughs> Viewed narrowly, it holds that a federal court, when deciding issues subject to state law, has to defer to the opinions of state courts. As my brother said, sounds like a barn burner. <laughs> As we will see, that proposition is often false. But the problem with Erie isn't just its narrow result, the problem is its reasoning. As the Supreme Court would later put it, Erie overruled not just a past line of cases, but a particular way of looking at the law. Erie rejected a category of law, sometimes called general common law or just general law, that was at one time fundamental to our federal system. This unwritten law was used and produced by legal systems in many different jurisdictions. And while the name general law might be unfamiliar, it comprised a variety of entirely familiar bodies of law. The common law, as inherited from England, the principles of equity, the rules of admiralty and maritime law, the law of nations, not only public international law governing states and diplomats and treaties and so on, but private international law, rules of jurisdiction and choice of law, or international commercial law. General parliamentary law, which governs each new House of Representatives before it adopts formal rules. Military law, including the laws of war, and so on. All of these sources, in Judge Fletcher's excellent formulation, were laws for the United States, if not laws of the United States. General law wasn't supreme law of the land under Article VI, overruling any law to the contrary, but it was law of the land which both state and federal governments could employ when no other law controlled. Now, Erie didn't erase all these other bodies of law, given that their names are still very familiar to you. But it did suggest that they were not really shared, that all law in the United States was either state or federal. 
as Justice Scalia put it in his plurality opinion in Shady Grove, where neither the Constitution, a treaty, nor a statute provides the rule of decision or authorizes a federal court to supply one, state law must govern because there can be no other law. Yet starting with the very day Erie was decided, federal courts have honored this rule only in the breach, inventing federal common law that preempts state rules without any textual authority. And their attempts to force all of these different sources into two boxes labeled state and federal have left us unable to understand basic aspects of American jurisprudence, the substantive canons of statutory interpretation, the scope and force of international law, the law governing interstate relations, or even the fundamental individual rights that the Constitution protects. And Erie destroyed this part of American law for surprisingly bad reasons. The court held that the prior 150 years of case law were not just mistaken, but philosophically impossible. It reasoned that there simply can be no law without a legislator, that just as statutory rules are made by legislatures, common law rules are necessarily made by judges that it is the judge's job to make new rules, whether the federal or state constitutions give them that power. That in short, the common law necessarily is whatever judges say it is. These philosophical claims by and large are no longer seen as credible, at least in the academy. But among lawyers and judges, they still have a fair deal of influence. I would say a corrupting influence, one that encourages judges to act and lawyers to induce them to act in excess of their true authority. So in this talk, I hope to turn from this rather dark picture of Erie to hopefully a somewhat more hopeful uh, picture of what life will look like after Erie, how law will operate on the happy and glorious day on which Erie has been overturned. <laughs> this is not a prediction that Erie will be overturned. Um, some legal seismologists have discerned rumblings in that direction. But we have no guarantee that courts will get things right. The arc of jurisprudence does not always bend toward intellectual coherence. <laughs> Rather than make predictions, I hope to set out something of a research agenda, to think through some of the problems that overturning Erie might pose, so that when the time does come to reconsider Erie, those who do so will have a clear path to follow. And the most important feature of life after Erie will not be particular doctrines that the courts enforce, but the attitudes with which they enforce them. To reject Erie is to recognize, as Justice Scalia put it in Rogers v. Tennessee, quoting Francis Bacon, that the judge's office is used to carry and not used to are, to interpret law and not to make law or give law. When this power to make law is conferred by a statute or constitution, maybe a judge can lawfully wield it. But one hopes that after Erie, we will recognize this authority as one that no officials, least of all judges, have any right to arrogate to themselves. So, Erie. Erie began as a lawsuit by Harry James Tompkins, who was on the Erie Railroad's right of way in Pennsylvania when he was allegedly struck by a door projecting out of a train. Um, it has been alleged that Tompkins was lying, that the facts of the case could not be as they were, but let's leave that alone. Because of where he was allegedly standing, the Pennsylvania courts would deem him a trespasser and without remedy. But the federal courts disagreed and the railroad was a New York corporation, which meant that the parties were diverse and Tompkins could and did sue in federal court. The Supreme Court saw this forum shopping as constitutionally illegitimate. Who can walk where in Pennsylvania is clearly a question of Pennsylvania law. But this hardly answers the question because Pennsylvania law and Pennsylvania courts are not the same thing. Pennsylvania could have passed a statute freeing the railroad of liability, but it didn't or it might have had a local custom departing from ordinary common law rules, but it didn't. Instead, Pennsylvania courts were ostensibly trying to apply the standard common law rule, and federal courts were ostensibly trying to apply the standard common law rule. Both courts were doing the same thing, and so one might think that neither has to defer to the other. Or at least that's what American courts had held for the prior 150 years of case law. In earlier cases, most notably Swift v. Tyson, the federal courts hadn't just asked, what do the state courts think? But rather, why did they think it? If a contract case turned on the law of Japan, as Hamilton and the Federalists suggested that it might, then federal courts would look to that law, just as state courts would. And the same were true if the case turned on the common law brought over from England. In such cases, as Justice Story put it, 
the state tribunals are called upon to perform the like functions as ourselves. Congress and the Rules of Decision Act had declared the laws of the several states to be rules of decision in cases where they apply. And those laws incorporated the common law by reference. But state court decisions, Story wrote, were not of themselves laws. They were interpretations of laws adopted by the state legislature or by long established legal, local customs. So the law at issue in Erie wasn't Pennsylvania common law in the sense of customs or usages specific to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but the common law, the same one other states were using too. And the federal courts were trying to do Pennsylvania law using the sources of law Pennsylvania had prescribed and maybe doing a better job of it than Pennsylvania's own courts. None of this reasoning required that there be any common law of America, as Justice Marshall once disparagingly put it, in the sense of a federal common law that preempts contrary state laws or customs. But there certainly was a common law for America from which states and the federal government could draw at need. And Marshall called it that generally recognized and long established law which forms the substratum of the laws of every state. To do without that kind of law was unimaginable to the founders, so much so that the anti-federalists, such as George Mason and the pseudonymous Agrippa, criticized the Constitution for not incorporating English common law as law of the United States. And the federalist response was precisely that the Constitution did not and should not fix the unwritten law in constitutional amber, making it the exclusive preserve of federal courts. Instead, it merely left that law as it found it, as general law, applying in the absence of any other competent source. Now, Erie's critique of this past case law was in part that prior courts had gotten their history wrong. Um, on this point, I will not go into details other than to say I think it fair, based on the literature, to say that Justice Brandeis has been conclusively refuted. But it has also been argued yeah, on Erie's behalf that federal courts were not always careful about this, to differentiate state local customs from attempts to follow a more general law. But Erie's main critique of general law was not historical or political, but philosophical. That there simply could not be such a body of law. That law does not exist without some definite authority behind it. That it is a fallacy to imagine any transcendental body of law beyond the pronouncement of a particular state, whether it be of its legislature or of its Supreme Court. Now here I must confess, that in my younger days, when I was writing my undergraduate thesis on the medieval Lex Mercatoria under the direction of Professor Thomas Bisson, who I'm honored to have as a colleague here today, I found Erie's reasoning rather persuasive. <laughs> How could mere customs turn into laws? How could there be any laws that were not made by a legislator? In my defense, I can say only that when I was a child, I spake as a child, <laughs> but since then I have put away childishness. <laughs> For the idea that there can be no laws without lawmakers or rules without rulemakers simply collapses upon inspection. When it comes to rules of grammar or spelling, no one thinks that rules always require rulemakers. Obviously, in a causal sense, someone had to be the first American to spell behavior without a U. When Noah Webster wanted to simplify American English and take out all of the fancy pants British vowels, he took the U out of behavior and it stuck. And so, in a causal sense, Americans today spell behavior without a U because Noah Webster did it. But there is no rule of American English that says that Noah Webster has power over proper spelling, the way that arguably the Académie Française has power over proper French. Nor do dictionary editors today have any power to declare new spellings if they try to change words the way that Webster tried without success to take the A out of feather because he thought it was unnecessary. <laughs> They're being bad dictionary editors, whether or not their suggestions catch on. In this regard, there is no real difference between a customary spelling rule, like I, I before E except after C, and a customary legal rule, like no interest is good unless it must vest, if at all, no later than 21 years after some life and being of the creation of the interest. I, I know that I am in a special place where that is a laugh line. <laughs> a legal system can regard as law what is customarily accepted as law by legal, lawyers and legal experts, just as language can regard as proper grammar what is customarily accepted as proper grammar by third grade English teachers and grammar students. To say that rules require rulemakers, that laws require lawmakers, 
is to ignore centuries of customs and customary law from across the globe, all of which were formed through human action, obviously, but not necessarily through human design. No one calls rules of grammar a brooding omnipresence in the sky, in the famous sneer of Justice Holmes, and no one should so regard the rules of the common law. Realists like Justice Holmes and Brandeis knew, of course, that courts sometimes applied customary law. They just thought that the rules became law only when the courts applied them, that the judges couldn't help making law. To Holmes, when the constitution of a state establishes a Supreme Court, it necessarily declares that, quote, the decisions of that court should establish the law until modified by statute. Indeed, even Justice Scalia wrote that he was, quote, not so naive, nor did he think our forebears were, as to be unaware that judges, in a real sense, make law. He required only that, quote, they make it as judges make it, which is to say, as though they were finding it, discerning what the law is, rather than decreeing what it is today changed to, or what it will tomorrow be. But that, I am afraid, is also an intellectual error. Just as graders of a standardized test might be tasked with enforcing the rules of grammar and spelling as generally practiced now, so too judges might be tasked with applying law and not making it, as the vast majority of judges and officials at the founding understood their task to be. Over time, of course, the changing habits of test graders and English teachers might produce a slow change in the rules. That's how spelling and grammar change over time. And in the same way, the errors or missteps of judges might contribute to a new consensus on the content of the law. But at any given time, their job can be to apply the rules and not to make them. Chief Justice Marshall was no naïve. He understood very well how past judges had, for example, introduced by legal fictions a distinction between local and transitory actions. Even so, he thought that fact gave him no authority to depart from the law as it presently stood. If, quote, this technical distinction be firmly established, if all other judges respect it, I cannot venture to disregard it. This, then, is what's wrong with Erie that it rejected sources of law with centuries of history and undoubted validity in our system on the strength of abstract philosophical arguments that are unambiguously false. So if we correct these intellectual errors, what follows? What will happen once Erie is overruled? Well, at the state level, the answer might be not much. Many general law rules that states used to follow have been displaced through state court rulings that rejected the common law consensus. At this point, many decades later, those new rulings reflect the local customs and usages, which federal courts would have to respect even on Justice Story's view. For example, if California's Chief Justice Trainer chose to impose strict liability for defective products, then it does not matter whether that was the general law then or now. California is not trying to follow the general law, and it doesn't matter what the federal courts think it is. On most areas of what we now call state common law, the federal courts will just do what they're currently doing, applying the state common law as the state courts perceive it to be. But there would be at least three important differences. First, some state courts don't portray themselves as departing from the general law. Uh, my understanding is that in Georgia, courts still claim to enforce the general common law rather than declaring the common law of Georgia only. So a federal court applying Georgia law, which incorporates the general law, has to follow that cross-reference, honestly, even if it disagrees with Georgia's courts on a specific outcome in a particular type of case. Second, even when state courts explicitly depart from general law, a federal court should follow those departures as they are today, and not as they might be tomorrow. Right now, federal courts regularly perform what is called the eerie guess. They predict, from whatever omens and cloud patterns and bird entrails they can, how the state Supreme Court will rule in a future case. The idea is to make the outcome in federal court identical to what the outcome would have been in state court had the case been filed there. But a federal court's job is to apply the law, not what might later become the law. If the state's past decisions represent binding customs, they're binding in federal court too. And if a state constitution authorizes its Supreme Court to change that law, then OK, a federal court should respect that exercise. But if the state Supreme Court hasn't acted yet and hasn't used its power to change the law, the federal court has to apply state law as it stands. It cannot guess in a diversity case 
what a state Supreme Court will do next, any more than it may guess in a statutory case what Congress will do next. The law is whatever it is right now. Third, rejecting Erie might require a different approach to retroactivity. Under current due process doctrine, legislatures sometimes can apply new rules of law retroactively. But state courts that make law almost always apply their rules retroactively to the parties in the case before them, if no one else. If we see a difference between making law and finding it or applying it, then we should not tolerate state courts making new rules and then pretending to have found them in existing law, the way the state of Maryland did in Bowie versus City of Columbia when it threw civil rights protesters in jail for acts that were not criminal when they were committed. Yet a few decades later in Rogers versus Tennessee, the Supreme Court allowed the state to do that very thing, to prosecute as murder an act that was not murder at the time it was committed. Over a spirited dissent from Justice Scalia, the court held that this deliberate and retroactive change to law was the sort of, quote, incremental and reasoned development that is the foundation of the common law system. That is a breathtakingly ahistorical statement, and it is possible only for a court that is wearing eerie era blinders. Instead, we should take state law seriously and assess deliberate and retroactive changes to that law under the same standards, whether they come from legislatures or from courts. That said, these three changes notwithstanding, the overall outlook for state law post Erie would be much the same. Turning to federal law, though, things will be very different. Recognizing that Erie was wrong would mean abolishing the category of federal common law. The same day Erie was decided, the court announced the Hinderleiter case, deciding how much water from the Colorado River should go to Colorado or to New Mexico. This could not be a question of state law, because then one of the states would just declare, we get all the water. And it could not be federal law, because there's nothing in the Constitution or any statute that talks about it. And it couldn't be general law, because roughly five minutes before the opinion announcement, they had said that, Erie, that that was just a fallacy and didn't exist. So the court invented a brand new kind of law, which it called federal common law, a category nowhere in the Constitution or any statute or treaty, but which it said was nonetheless supreme law of the land, providing jurisdiction for federal courts, and can be made up by federal judges on the spot. That is a pretty neat trick, <laughs> especially as the founding era sources are uniformly against the existence of any such kind of law. And the only two prior mentions of federal common law in the US reports both said there is no such thing. <laughs> so how did the federal courts get away with this? Well, part of the explanation is that the old general law rules had to go somewhere. In a state border case or a water apportionment case, it's obvious that state laws can't apply. You can't say, we get all the water or we own all of New Jersey. <laughs> so the federal courts have to use some other source of law. Now, in the old cases, like Rhode Island versus Massachusetts, that meant general law. They would select from, quote, the known and settled principles of national and municipal jurisprudence the appropriate law of the case. And sometimes when those questions were hard, federal courts would have to exercise judgment. But that didn't mean that they could rewrite those laws or redraw all the state borders into hexagons if they thought that looks better on the map. The same goes for other parts of federal common law. So if federal contracts can't be governed by state law and they have to be governed by something, courts could look to whatever the general law already provides. As the court recognized in United States versus Chambers, the general law is not the same as the majority rule in a state-by-state -state survey. Most states might have changed the pre-existing rule by statute, and the general rule is the one that's thought to apply if there's no statute to the contrary. The rule we would typically introduce with the phrase, at common law, comma, dot, dot, dot. So if at common law, comma, dot, 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 a certain rule of contract law applies, then that presumably is what applies to federal obligations unless some act of Congress provides otherwise. But the one thing federal courts can't do is try to improve on that law. So for example, in Boyle versus United Technologies Corp, Justice Scalia, there's here laughter already, <laughs> Justice Scalia purported to invent a new rule governing suits by, against military contractors. Those suits involved uniquely federal interests, the court said, and fit within the discretionary function exception of the Federal Tort Claims Act. So ordinary state law did not apply. 
But instead of kicking out the suit entirely, as would usually be appropriate for a discretionary function, and instead of citing general law, which would apply in the absence of a state-specific rule, the court crafted a new doctrine of military contractor immunity, with various exceptions and qualifications, not based on any rule of law, but on the court's sense of the best policy. Now, maybe the rule they came up with was a great idea. But as judges, they had no authority to impose it, any more than they would have had authority to redraw the 50 states as hexagons. That kind of creativity is for the politician and for the law professor and not for the federal judge. <laughs> Once we recognize federal common law for what it is and restore general law to its rightful place, we can understand a number of other basic aspects of our system that currently go unexplained. So let's start with statutory interpretation. Today, the court is in disarray on the substantive canons of interpretation. These are things like the rule of lenity, which reads statutes in favor of criminal defendants, the Indian canon, which reads them in favor of Indian tribes, or the presumption against implied repeal, which reads them in favor of maintaining prior law. Unlike linguistic canons, which are summaries of how actual people in Congress actually speak, substantive canons can seem like judge-made efforts to mess with whatever rule Congress has laid down. As Justice Barrett put it, these canons are at apparent odds with the central premise from which textualism proceeds. So why not follow Justice Kagan's suggestion in a recent oral argument that, quote, we should just toss them all out? Different justice jurists have advanced different rationales. So Justice Gorsuch, in a recent opinion, portrays some of these canons as rules of constitutional avoidance, trying to avoid doing something unconstitutional. Justice Barrett portrays other such canons as situating text in context, recognizing that some things go without saying. But not every substantive canon has a clear constitutional source. And often, lawmakers are entirely unaware of these presumptions. If no one in Congress remembers that a canon exists, can it really be said to go without saying? <laughs> General law provides a more understandable approach. As a co-author and I have argued elsewhere, substantive canons are just common law rules for interpreting statutes. Think about the land grant canon, that grants to private parties are construed narrowly in favor of the sovereign. Senators who vote for some, to grant some land don't have to know that this canon exists. In fact, they don't even have to know that the bill, which they didn't read, grants anybody any land. All they have to do is vote for it, and the land grant canon applies of its own force. Now, sure, you could invent arguments that the land grant canon really serves constitutional values or common sense, you know, it helps us preserve the public fisc and so on. But there are also good arguments for a canon going the other way. The government is more powerful than the private parties, it drafts the grants, it should be subject to contra preferentum, and so on and so forth. The best explanation for the traditional land grant rule is just that it's the traditional rule that has been long recognized as a rule of law governing statutory interpretation. And while common law can change over time, just as grammar and spelling change over time, that doesn't pose a problem here. Because however much land Congress granted was determined at the time of the grant. So we read the canon as it stood then, just as we read the statute using grammar and spelling as it stood then. This canon can't be a rule of state common law. It wouldn't apply differently in different districts. And it isn't a rule of federal common law, which federal judges could shrink or expand at will. It's a rule of general law that operates until overridden. And precisely because it's a rule of law, it can operate without anyone needing to think about it or even liking it very much. Uh, for another example, the charming Betsy canon that says Congress seeks to avoid violating international law is almost certainly wrong as a statement about Congress. <laughs> if you told Congress, this bill violates international law, you would get more votes. <laughs> but so long as the canon exists as part of our law, it applies to statutory interpretation without anyone in Congress needing to remember that it is there. This brings us to another advantage of general law, that it can explain how our system interacts with customary international law. This has been an intellectual battleground for decades. Some scholars draw on the Supreme Court's pronouncement in the Paquete Habana that international law is part of our law, and conclude that international law must be federal law, 
Other scholars argue that international law is at best state law. If it isn't codified in a statute or treaty, it isn't supreme law of the land under Article VI. And the Supreme Court has picked a rather confusing middle path, deciding in the Sosa case that some rules of international law were federalized in 1789, and some rules were not. By now, you have probably guessed the way that I think about this, which is that customary international law is general law. It applies in its own force throughout the nation, but it does not preempt contrary state or federal law adopted within those governments' authorities. For example, some say international law bans capital punishment. If true, that would not, on its own, stop a state from employing it, because capital punishment is imposed under state statutes, which can override common law rules. And as a choice of law matter, criminal penalties are clearly the sort of thing we look to state statutes to determine. By contrast, consider the international law rule that visiting heads of state are immune from suit. So if King Charles visited Harvard and were served with process from a Massachusetts court, not only could Congress criminalize that service as an offense against the law of nations, but the king would have a right to remove the case to federal court, which, in the absence of a statute, would look to the general law of head of state immunity to decide whether it can force him to answer. And the fact that Massachusetts thinks there's no head of state immunity wouldn't answer the question for a federal court, which determines its own personal jurisdiction for itself. In this way, federal courts can make use of international law without that law needing to be federal in nature. Now, the perceptive listener will have noticed that I have repeatedly mentioned choice of law rules in regard to various topics that state laws can actually govern. General law often applies simply because, as a choice of law matter, no state law can displace it. Again, in a state borders case, we don't ask what the state thinks and whether it says it owns all of New Jersey. We ask what subjects a state law can lawfully control, whether this is a case where they apply. But the perceptive reader will note that the Constitution has no rules for where state laws apply, where their borders are, which cases their courts can hear, and so on. And one might ask, how can they have forgotten this? How could they have stitched together a union of 13 squabbling states without any rules to decide who can decide what? The answer, as you all have guessed by now, is that they didn't need to, because they had rules of general law. When a case involved different states, or land grants from different states, or citizens of different states, the Constitution left the choice of law rules as it found them. It just provided new institutions, namely federal courts under Article III, which could apply general law rules to these topics without having to defer to either state's courts. Now, it may be that since Erie, the general law consensus on these topics has fractured. Certainly, after the conflicts revolution of the 1950s and 60s, choice of law is a deeply divided field, described by its own practitioners as a dismal swamp. <laughs> I should know because I teach it, and my students tend to agree. <laughs> so it may be that only Congress imposing new rules under its Article IV powers can clear up the confusion in interstate relations to which Erie and its progeny have given birth. But to the extent that there are any clear rules that still command customary adherence, or rules that are still recognized as those which would apply but for explicit departures from an ongoing tradition, courts applying the general law can still enforce them. But the answers have to be found there and not hidden somewhere in the text of the Constitution, even in invisible ink. It may be, as I've argued elsewhere, that the 14th Amendment gives teeth to the general law principles of personal jurisdiction. The same might be true, though I suggest this more hesitantly, of general law principles of choice of law. But the principles themselves, in substance, remain principles of general law. Indeed, the same might be true of the Constitution's approach to fundamental individual rights. It might have sought to give teeth to pre-existing rights defined by other sources, and not to frame and define new rights of its own. As I mentioned before, when the anti-federalist Agrippa complained about the new Constitution's lack of a Bill of Rights, he framed his complaint in terms of rights that existed at common law and the danger that the common law could be overridden by legislation. When Congress assembled the Bill of Rights in response, its provisions were said officially in the instrument proposing them to be declaratory of common law rights that were already in place. Americans in the early 19th century took the same view of unenumerated fundamental rights, 
Justice Washington in Corfield versus Coriel defined the privileges and immunities of citizens under Article 4 as including a wide variety of common law rights. Quote, those privileges and immunities which are in their nature fundamental, which belong of right to the citizens of all free governments, and which have at all times been enjoyed by the citizens of the several states which compose this union from the time of their becoming free, independent, and sovereign. These unenumerated rights were the product of unwritten law, and they existed across Anglo-American jurisdictions, the characteristic features of general law. As two co-authors and I argue in a forthcoming paper, this understanding of the Article IV Privileges and Immunities Clause was borrowed by those who wrote the 14th Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause. That clause also didn't define any of the rights that it protected, but then again, it didn't need to. The rights were defined and conferred by general law and merely secured and enforced by the Constitution and Congress. As Justice Bradley put it in his dissent in the slaughterhouse cases, the privileges or immunities of American citizenship were the traditionary rights which the people had inherited from their ancestors, the rights of Englishmen which the government, whether restricted by express or implicit limitations, cannot take away or impair. This picture of the Constitution as securing rights rather than conferring them and looking to pre-existing law for their content would produce a new and doubtless very different jurisprudence of individual rights. I don't pretend to know what it would contain, but it would be much more accurate than a jurisprudence that discards the actual sources of these rights and then sends judges scurrying in to make, try to make something new out of the wreckage. In this field, as in many others, the rejection of Erie is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> Yet the last and most fundamental change of all from abolishing Erie may be in our attitudes towards common law judging. Justice Scalia once described the first year of law school, some of you are now in, as consisting of playing common law judge, which in turn consists of playing king, devising, out of the brilliance of one's own mind, those laws which ought to govern mankind. This system of making law by judicial opinion, he wrote, is what every American law student, every newborn American lawyer, first sees when he opens his eyes. Yet this system is not built into the nature of things, nor did it come about by accident. It was constructed deliberately by those who viewed rule by judges as a superior mode of governance to rule by legislatures. Consider the following discussion from Justice Cardozo, quoting Justice Wheeler of Connecticut. That court best serves the law which recognizes that the rules of law which grew up in a remote generation may, in the fullness of experience, be found to serve another generation badly, and which discards the old rule when it finds another rule of law represents what should be according to the established and settled judgment of society. It is thus great writers upon the common law have discovered the source and method of its growth, and in its growth found its health and life. It is not and should not be stationary. Change of this character should not be left to legislature. Now to some, that model of judging is acceptable, even admirable. But to me, it is the height of arrogance, in the literal sense of arrogating to oneself a power that has already been entrusted elsewhere. For the duty to apply the law as it stands is not a blind fealty to the past, but a commitment to the lawful separation of powers in the present. Why is it that changes of this character should not be left to the legislature? The legislature is chosen directly by the society whose settled judgment the judges are claimed to apply. The legislature is responsible to that society through elections at regular intervals. It is able to consider all sources of information, not just submissions by particular parties. It's capable of acting broadly outside the confines of any one particular case. And beyond and above all this, it is the body actually vested with powers to legislate, to change the law and which can exercise those powers in part by leaving some rules of law, even unjust or archaic rules of law, as they presently stand. For judges to make changes without authority is to deprive the legislature of its choice, which it has full power to make, to focus on some problems first and otherwise to leave well enough alone. Now, if a state constitution really vests legislative powers like these and its judges, then of course the judges may use them, subject to the retroactivity and other concerns I mentioned earlier. But not every state constitution does this. Georgia's arguably does not. Nor perhaps does the Massachusetts constitution, of which the relevant provision was written in 1780, and which insists that, quote, 
the judicial department shall never exercise the legislative and executive powers or either of them. <laughs> the assumption that a state court must be capable of changing law, because that's just what common law judging is, is both ahistorical and wrong. It is not a form of realism, but a cynicism to the point of falsehood, one that seeks to conceal by portraying as ordinary and part of the nature of things what would in any other context be an obvious and repellent power grab. It is precisely the sort of myth-making of which followers of the general law are often accused, giving cover to judges who exercise one power under the cover of another. To reject this myth-making is to say that state constitutions and not judges should get to say what powers judges have, and to clear a path for the people to govern themselves. Now, reversing these attitudes among both lawyers and judges will not be the work of a day. And it could be argued that Erie is too well entrenched, its tendrils too deeply entangled with American law for this excrudescence ever to be safely removed. <laughs> So in the last few minutes, I'd like to address the argument that the pre-Erie world is simply too far gone for its return to be advised. To begin with, I note that there is no simply too far gone clause of Article 5. <laughs> if the federal constitution does not vest federal common law making powers in judges, and if we still acknowledge that constitution and not any successor system as the governing rule, then to paraphrase Justice Scalia, we cannot justify new powers, quote, on an adverse possession theory of judicial authority. <laughs> that judges have long claimed the powers in question, and that legislatures have not disputed those claims with sufficient vigor. It is, of course, possible in certain areas of law for the necessary consensus to have broken down. In those areas, the local customs and usages might be all we've got left. But the reasoning of Erie was not that the general law had fallen apart or that the people had ever voted to reject it, but that there was not and had never been any general law, that general law was impossible. When a court is faced with this kind of demonstrable error, traditional doctrines of stare decisis pose no bar to beginning the work of repair. Nor would traditional notions of reliance. Reversing Erie will not replace vast swaths of state case law or mean that anyone who owns a house today will find themselves not owning the house tomorrow. It would mostly mean that certain powers claimed by judges to make further changes to the law are untenable, that we might have to accept some changes the courts have already wrought, but at the same time go and sin no more. <laughs> Indeed, the formal overruling of Erie would not be the work of a day either. When asked to impose its own novel rule of federal common law or to guess what a state court is likely to do, a federal court can just say no. Its job is to apply pre-existing law, not to make new law, which Congress and the states remain free to do. When asked to apply a state decision, a federal court can ask if that decision claims to follow some other source of law, or merely to interpret its own state's customs and statutes to which the federal court should defer. And if the state decision does purport to alter prior law, the federal court can ask whether under the state constitution it had the authority so to act. In other words, a federal court can place authority where it belongs, in the people of the United States and of each state via their own constitution, statutes, and customs, and not, or not necessarily or automatically, in the judges who staff their courts. As Justice Frankfurter once put it, wisdom too often never comes, and so one ought not reject it merely because it comes too late. <laughs> when we ask, when should we start to overrule Erie, the only answer, is that now is an acceptable time. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I understand that we have a few minutes for questions, if any uh, folks have some. If that presentation was not completely consistent. Um, I think I understood you to say that when there was uh, that that when there was federal uh, general law uh, that uh, it wasn't binding on the states, and so that uh, states would have one version of what the law was, and federal courts would have another version. So how then do you deal with the problem that 
when, when a litigant chooses the court, the litigant is choosing the law that's going to, to apply. So, so definitely they are. I mean, the counterpart to that is twofold. One, in a system where they know that that's going to happen, that can have a um, sort of controlling influence on state courts. So Judge Fletcher, in his magnificent article on the law of marine insurance, which I commend to all of you, um, <laughs> exciting times, um, notes that state courts tried to follow what the federal courts were doing precisely to avoid that kind of forum shopping. And the result was a greater degree of uniformity across the, 50, the states. Well, now, states obviously, tried to follow it, but not, not states right. in general. Right, so, so obviously a state, a state court can decide that it reads the general law a different way, that it does not want to follow uh, the federal courts. If that forum shopping is a really big problem, there's a solution, which is called a statute. You know, the state legislature can just say, we are enacting a statute on this topic, which is within our authority to control. And if it's within their authority to control, the Rules of Decision Act says, and Justice Story would agree, you've got to follow it. And if the state legislature doesn't think that that forum shopping is a big problem, it can leave it alone. And if the state legislature likes the federal court's rule better, it can do that by statute. And you can do whatever it wants. Um, the worry about forum shopping is a worry. I mean, it's not, it's not a non-problem. But it's not as great of a problem, perhaps, as some of the problems created by efforts to avoid it. It probably depends how different the state and federal versions of the law are. And how much pressure there is on the legislature to get off its stuff and pick an answer. For sure. So how do you account for the eerie? So fabulous. Fabulous lecture, so interesting. Um, I think now you say. I think Justice Scal I think Justice Scalia would even have liked the parts he would have disagreed with. Um, so, um, how do you account for the timing of this? Which, as you say, it, it created a great deal of federal federal judicial power at a time when the trend in other respects was self denial of power, as the as the decline of Lochner and the rise of the rational basis test and the aggrandizement, uh, not the aggrandizement, the recognition of the discretion and authority of both state and state legislatures and Congress, you have this very, very big moment of the exercise of new judicial, federal judicial power. How, how, is there a way to explain it historically? So, so I think in some ways it's sort of unintended consequences. So in the progressive movement, the federal courts were the bad guys. You know, they were the ones who were doing Lochner. They were the ones who were um, enforcing federal common law against the more progressive state courts. Um, and uh, they were protecting inter you know, big corporations, which were the parties that were out of state and therefore got diversity jurisdiction and so on. Um, and so you know, up through Erie, the idea was we are corralling the power of federal courts by saying that they have to follow state courts. And then, you know, same day, Hinderleiter, they say, oh, well, except for these, you know, occasional tiny areas that are, you know, interstitial and not a big deal. And it's true, like, as a, as a, as a sort of fraction of all litigation, federal common law is not big. But the kind of powers that are assumed through federal common lawmaking are pretty enormous. And so, you know, I just don't think anyone had thought that far ahead. Thank you. Press the last thing. So this is wonderful. Um, I want to I want to defend Brandeis a bit. Sure. <laughs> because you made it sound like Brandeis just didn't understand that there was a way of thinking of law consistent with your conception of general law, as if he made an error in interpreting the logical possibility of something like general law. But the famous quote, of course, from Erie is, law in the way in which courts speak of it today, expressly acknowledging a point that you made that I thought was brilliant, um, that this way of thinking of law that you're describing is constructive. Like, we come to think about it in a particular way. And it sounds like what, to me, what Brandeis is saying is they thought about it in one way, we think of law in a different way. And so if that's true, it's not so much that he's asserting a logical error as he's reporting a sociological fact about how American law had evolved. And I wonder whether 
the criticisms then, um, or let me spin it the other way. I wonder whether you then bear the burden of like defending the reconstruction of that old way of conceiving of law. And like, what would that work look like? Like, how do we change the way we speak of law or law in which we courts speak of it today? Um, recognizing it as a sociological, constructed, completely not given to us by nature conception that we have to defend. Sure, so, so I would a little bit resist the hypo in that Brandeis A made the historical arguments about the Rules of Decision Act that I didn't talk about here, but I think it's fair to say current scholarship says are wrong. B describes the old view of law not just as like an alternative that you know, some societies might look at law this way and we happen not to. He calls it a fallacy. You know, he's, he's quoting the Holmes opinions that call it an illusion, you know, uh, that, that say that this does not exist and cannot exist. And so I don't, I don't think that the right way to read Brandeis is as saying, we used to think of law that way. It's a perfectly fine way to think of law. We now think of law a different way. And so as a matter, in some sense, of legal custom or of customary law, we now reject all of these different authorities. Um, even if that were the case, though, if we imagine like Brandeis II, who does think that and say that, or actually, America, I do think it's significant that actual Brandeis did not think that because it's sort of further evidence that um, this is not a change in the general law in the sense of a change in legal custom. It is rather a false belief about legal custom, which a court now can, can uh, resolve in a way that's different from if our legal customs just changed. That might be a different kind of problem. But assume Brandeis II says that. I think even in that world, that wouldn't license a lot of what the Supreme Court has done. So I don't think that the Supreme Court could, as a matter of federal common lawmaking, invent federal common law. I don't think that that's within their powers under the Constitution. I don't think it could invent the Erie guess. Um, maybe it could invent uh, the Claxon case, which says that you have to look to state uh, court rules for choice of law. Um, the, the reconceptualization there would have to be assuming that they're saying, we today choose to follow a different custom, or our sort of legal custom is evolving, and we now think this about the sources of law, I don't think that a lot of what's done post Erie could survive under that model. You might just have no general law and not a whole lot to replace it either. Um, but I don't think you would get federal common law or a variety of other things. Is it yes? Thanks so much, Professor. And this question may come from the ignorance of a 1L, so forgive me if that's the case. But you spoke some about the difference between states where the courts are empowered to change the law and states where they are not. And that raised to me the question of by what authority can federal courts take on the role of interpreting a state's constitution to decide whether or not that state's courts have the power in contravention of what that state's Supreme Court has said? Sure. So in general, um, you defer to the courts of a jurisdiction on what its law is. That's the rule for France, it's the rule for Japan, it's the rule for Mississippi. You know, so like if they interpret their statutes or their constitution a certain way, you know, generally we just take that as given. Now it may be possible, to the extent that a federal interest is involved, that there's a laugh test. So if a state says, as the court did in Bowie versus City of Columbia, we have looked at our statute which on its face does not criminalize this conduct. And we just announced for the first time, like, oh, it always criminalized that conduct. Therefore, you civil rights protesters go to jail. The court's like, no, you can't do that. And you can't do that because you have a federal right to due process and not to be sent to jail if there is no law prescribing your conduct. And you have a federal right against ex post facto laws. So there may be a laugh test criterion for a state Supreme Court that reads the Massachusetts Constitution and says, yes, we have this power. Um, and you know, maybe one could get around that if it's sort of so settled and seems agreed by all the other bodies in the state and so on that you know, maybe this passes the left test. We just don't know how they do it there. But um, if a federal court, you know, a federal court can't help but look at the statutes of the state to answer Bowie versus City of Columbia type problems. 
And so it might have to do so here, too. This also, I think, and you know, didn't address, might be an answer to some of the questions about judicial takings and the famous case, Stop the Beach Renourishment, um, which involved whether Florida could assert eminent domain uh, or could claim as its own various portions of the beach. And um, you know, the Supreme Court divided on that question of whether there's such a thing as a judicial taking. But to my mind, it would depend a lot on the laugh test question. Is this just not something that we can plausibly say state law provided, such that you're obviously taking away someone's property who had it before? Mr. King. If the, um, if the philosophical justification of general law superiority to federal common law is based on the notion that it is customary, What's to stop, like let's say Erie was overturned tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What's to stop a federal judge from saying, well, we've been using substantive canons for the last 50 years and they are therefore custom. So wouldn't the general law application be to still preserve these substantive canons? So I, I think substantive canons are customary laws. I think that's exactly what they are. But the, there's the status of that kind of customary law in our system is the status of general law, not federal common law in the sense of trumping contrary state law. Now, the substantive canons don't really apply to any state law. Like, there's no requirement that a state uh, statute be read that way. Um, so no one's really worried about that. But you could have other rules where, um, you know, the duress defense, for example. Like, there's no guarantee that a state has to have the same duress defense that the federal government does, even though duress is totally a common law topic. There's no duress statute. It's just sort of inferred from the common law that there is a defense of duress. Um, and it applies to federal statutes that make no mention of it. Um, so it would have that general law status. It would not be federal common law. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, so if the general law changes uh, from A to B, let's say, there has to be a first judge that applies that new general law. Mm -hmm. So how do you distinguish between that judge and uh, like a Cardozo? So what I would say is it is analogous to changes in grammar, changes in spelling, changes in fashion. Um, you know, Anna Wintour has no formal power to declare that you know wide ties are back. It's just that you know they put a person with a wide tie in the cover of Vogue, and maybe it's actually kind of outré and not really the fashion. But then it catches on, and ten years later we're like, yes, the fashion is wide ties. So the, the idea here is that you we, we don't have to say that the first person who acted according to a particular rule did so lawfully for it to be later the case that the accepted practice is now different from what it was, and now a judge acting lawfully has to follow that rule. That's what Marshall is saying in Livingston, saying like, yeah, that was introduced by a fiction, they were totally you know, wrong to do that, but now we've got it, and it's the accepted rule, and you know, as a matter of general custom, we follow it. So you, you don't need the power to make fetch happen. It just happens, <laughs> and then you go from there. That is a great place to <laughs> So um, as part of the chair lecture, we uh, provide the new chair holder with a gift. We wrap it carefully <laughs> so that it will be a surprise. <laughs> Professor Sachs, would you like to remove the wrapping and see what the gift is? <laughs> and we will have some refreshments in the next room as soon as we open these doors, and we will um, continue to celebrate and continue to discuss. Thank you, Professor.